guys, welcome back. It's me again, happy to see you here. Anyway, today is brought to you by Paul Manweller One. A couple months back, he suggested that I do a segment on, let me get a little closer. He suggested that I do a uh, an episode on female teachers who are caught with underage students, and that sparked my interest. So, because I'm a slacker on my pimping, I'm just now getting around to it. And I have um, culminated my top five uh, most notorious female teacher sex offenders list. So, before we dive in, as always, I want to say thank you for uh, watching me, for interacting with me, any of the comments, likes, dislikes, whatever, I appreciate it all. Uh, more than you know. Anyway, so let's jump in, okay? So, coming in at number five, I have Mary Kay Letourneau. She, to me, is the most notorious ever. I don't know why, but in my head she is. So, back in 1997, Mary Kay was married and she had four children with her husband. Um, she was an elementary school teacher and her victim uh, was actually in the sixth grade. So he was like 12 or 13 years old when this happened. And he was a former student of hers in the second grade. So that's when she met him. And to me, she's the most notorious because she ended up, there ended up being a lifetime movie made about it. She went on to marry her victim. And she also went on to have two children with her victim. So pretty much she's married and a teacher, four kids, obviously and a husband, and she chose to leave that behind and be with her victim, which is publicly known. His name is uh, Villy, and I cannot say his last name, but it's F-U-A-L-A-A-U, something like that. Eh. Anyway, in 1997, she ends up pleading guilty to two counts of second degree rape of a child, and while awaiting sentencing, she gave birth to her and Billy's child. Now the state, the uh, state was seeking a six-year prison sentence or six and a half-year prison sentence, um, and they reached a plea agreement with her to six months in jail, and then three months suspended, um, but no contact with her victim Billy. She was not supposed to have contact with him for life, okay? Mind you, they obviously have a child together. So after she completes her three months in jail, she's caught in the car with Billy. The judge revoked her plea agreement. The maximum sentence allowed by law was seven and a half years. So eight months after returning to prison, she gave birth to their second child, you heard right, their second child. She was imprisoned from 1998 to 2004. In the meantime, Billy is obviously still a kid, so his mother had to take on the burden of caring for the children that the two had together, as well as her own child, which was Billy. Um, that's just wild. But get this, she ends up getting out of, the, out of jail, and mind you, she was, um, I guess a part of the sentence that was imposed upon her originally was that she had no contact with him for life. However, the two ended up getting married in May 2005 and they were married for 14 years. They ended up separating just a few years ago in 2019 and she ended up dying of cancer in 2020. Let me put that into perspective for you. So Mary Kay, that's serving a total of seven and a half years. And she pleaded guilty to two counts of rape, uh, or excuse me, two counts second degree rape. Um, but think about that. Her original charges were um, rape of a minor, and that ended up being suspended in order for her just to serve that six months in jail and then three months suspended. My point here is that she literally, this was a 12, 13 year old kid, and ultimately, yes, she served a seven and a half year prison sentence. Um, she was 
required, I'm sure, to register as a sex offender. But originally, she only served six months in jail with a three-month suspended probation type thing. Okay? Now, if this was a man with a 12-year-old victim, I would be like, and I feel like most other people would want to throw the book at him, lock him up for life. Like, that is disgusting. And I view it just as disgusting with a woman, but it just amazes me the fact that she got such a light sentence. She shouldn't have been allowed to marry him, and obviously the boy needed some sort of counseling or something because I can't imagine trying to understand. Actually, I can because I've had my own situation similar to this, but I can't imagine as a 12 year old boy trying to understand that this person is a predator. This person is not my somebody to look up to and somebody to want to be with that kind of thing. Anyway, disgusting. Moving on, my number four is Deborah Beasley Lefebvre. And to me, she is most notable because her attorney was quoted as saying during the sentencing phase that she was, quote, too pretty for prison. While, yes, I agree she is attractive, I don't think anybody's too pretty for prison. You do the crime, you do the time. Am I right? Uh, aside from the whole being too pretty for prison, was noticeably uh, infamous in part because of this sex scandal, but also because of she dated Nick Carter from the Backstreet Boys in high school. So Deborah LaFave was charged in 2004 for her um, sexual encounter with a 14 year old student or she was a teacher at the time at angelo l at angelo l greco middle school in temple terrace florida 2005 she pleaded guilty to lewd and lascivious lewd and lascivious battery against a teenager lefave's plea bargain included no prison time so yeah deborah LaFave, her plea deal um, included no uh, no prison time and instead opted for a three-year house arrest due to safety concerns and then a seven-year probation. Basically what had happened was LaFave had sexual, sexual intercourse including oral sex with a student on four occasions. In May 2004 she and her victim went to Ocala, Florida um, to visit one of the victim's cousins and the aunt noticed, the boy's mother noticed that, you know, she seemed a little older and was provocatively dressed. So she tells the child slash victim, she tells his mother like, hey, this is suspicious. Let's find out what's going on here. So, um, the police get involved and they are following conversations between Lefebvre and um, her, her student, the victim, and they choose to meet up and during this meetup she's caught. Fortunately, before the trial began, the victim's mother found out that, that court TV was going to be a part of this case and that her son wouldn't, his identity would not be um, protected and because of that, he ended up, they ended up trying to drop the charges and um, he was very, very disturbed. Like uh, they had a psychiatrist come in and say, you know, it's going to take at least eight years to heal the boy from this mess. And he was just kind of a nervous wreck. Now, because of this, because the boy was under such um, emotional and mental duress, the parents decided to go to the prosecutors and just see. They asked the prosecutors to offer Lefebvre a deal that would avoid a trial, and in doing so, uh, the defense was willing to agree to plea. The defense was um, able to agree to a plea deal that Lefebvre would not serve any jail time. So she did plead guilty under that agreement and was sentenced basically to three years house arrest and had to be home by 10 p.m. not be around children. Um, 
And of course, you had to register as a sex offender. So, Lafave's defense attorney, uh, John Fitzgibbons, let me tell you what he said, and I quote, to place Debbie into a Florida state women's penitentiary, to place an attractive young woman in that kind of hellhole is like putting a piece of raw meat in with the lions, end quote. By saying that, he was basically saying she was too pretty to go to prison. And I don't think that's a thing, first of all. But second, let us just go back to the fact that um, her victim was 14 years old. And while, yes, she did have to register as a sex offender, she only pleaded guilty to lewd and lascivious battery against a teen. And the kicker for me is that afterward, um, Faith pretty much just attributed her criminal acts to being bipolar. Um, and she said that she had just intense and irregular mood swings, which yes, is part of it, and hypersexuality, which caused her to have poor judgment. That part of it had to do with the fact that her sister had recently been killed by a drunk driver. And that when she was 13, um, she was raped by a classmate. Now, I can um, sympathize with a lot of that because I have been a victim myself, um, and I'm also bipolar, bipolar 2, um, and never have I ever wanted to have sex with a kid in any form or fashion. Like, mm -mm, no. Not happening. Anywho, neither here nor there. But so the facts of this one are Deborah Beasley uh, Lefebvre was married and in 2004 she was charged for the sexual encounters that she had with her 14 year old student and all she served was three years of house arrest and seven years of probation and was registered as a sex offender. Does the crime fit the, uh, does the punishment fit the crime? I think not. Again, if this were a man, I would be ready to hang him. But that's just me. Lisa Lavoie. So in 2009, she was a 24 year old teacher at Maurice A. Donahue Elementary School. And that's in Massachusetts. She was charged with six, six counts of statutory rape, three counts of aggravated rape and abuse, and three counts of statutory rape. An enticement of a minor, um, regarding a 15 year old male student. So, how did this happen? Well, the boy's parents were alerted, um, or excuse me, the boy's parents alerted authorities. So, number three, I'm gonna butcher her name. Lisa Laveau, Lavoie, L-A-V-O-I-E, eh. Anyway, so in 2009, she is a 24 year old teacher at Maurice A. Donahue Elementary School in Massachusetts. Now, she's charged with six counts of statutory rape, three counts of aggravated rape and abuse, three counts of statutory rape, and enticement of a minor regarding a 15-year-old male student. How did she get caught? Well, the parents uh, of the victim were concerned that they might be having a relationship, and I guess that the boy, the victim, clued in his teacher, Miss Lisa, to let her know that they were onto it or whatever. So what do they do? They take off running. So they travel up and down the East Coast, and uh, that was in February, and then they were caught in June 2009, uh, the same year. They were, this is all happening in 2009, and she ends up only serving 18 months in jail. She ended up getting rearrested, but the judge was saying you know, when he sentenced her the first time to this 18 months, um, said that he didn't think she would be a reoffender and that it wouldn't be a problem. But then the boy ended up getting caught sneaking out, going over to her house and was like caught in her closet. So yeah, I guess was a sex offender always a sex offender? I don't know. Anyway, the whole thing's just crazy. To make matters worse, the victim obviously was still very into her and he 
goes to the judge and he's like, please don't take her away from me because the judge had ordered her to indefinitely not have any relationship with her victim. And he basically explained to the judge how emotionally tied to him he was, how he was to her and that, you know, they had this strong relationship and it wasn't just sexual and she was somebody important and special in his life and like, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine. So yeah, Miss Lisa here, she pretty much gets off with a slap on the wrist as well. Um, and during the time that she's caught with him again, he's actually 18. So the criminal charges that they were trying to bring against her eventually, I think ended up getting dropped. So literally she gets a slap on the wrist and the boy is clearly still into her. Whatever. It's just crazy. There's no way that would happen if you were a man. You would not get that sentence. Just no if, ands, or buts about it. And the fact that she didn't get charged with, you know, any kind of kidnapping or anything. I don't know what the laws are there, but uh, she took him and they traveled all up and down the East Coast. So it just, it's mind blowing that just a couple months in jail and you're registered as a sex offender, keep it moving. Whatever. It's crazy. I can't remember if I was counting down or counting up. Dang. Well, our next person, regardless of the number, is Lisa Robin Marinelli. Now, Miss Marinelli was a 40-year-old substitute teacher um, in uh, Newport Ritchie, Florida at Mitchell High School. She claims that she was looking for a suitor for her son, somebody to, I mean, for her son, for her daughter. She was looking for somebody to date her daughter. And that's how she was kind of introduced to her victim. They ended up sleeping together multiple times over the course of um, six months at her home as well as in her car. And she would text him and be like, oh, come over. Nobody's going to be home, yada, yada. Uh, yeah, but you're supposedly looking for him for your daughter? Like, what? What? How can you, how can you be interested in somebody you were looking for for your daughter? I don't know. Anyway, she was arrested, obviously. Uh, her friends and family are like, even her mother and her, her mother-in-law and her own husband claim that, you know, this just wasn't like her and they supported her and, and everybody was just kind of baffled by the fact that she, this would even happen, that she would do this. In 2008, she's charged with unlawful sex with a minor. And um, she would text him, like, how about a quickie uh, before school? I just need 20 minutes. Yeah, okay. 2009, she pleaded guilty to the unlawful... Um, sex with a minor and she was sentenced to get this y'all one year house arrest yes you heard right one year house arrest and was required to register as a sex offender that's it and that's all nothing else looking for a boyfriend for your daughter end up with a boyfriend for yourself and it just kills me that her husband was like on her side I mean, that's mind blowing in and of itself, but I, I, I don't know. I'm like speechless. I just, the whole, all this stuff just kind of weighs heavy on my mind because it's like, how can you only get a year house arrest? Like, I understand that yes, registering as a sex offender is a major thing, but the fact that you only have to serve a year in your house, like, hell no, you need to be in prison with all the rest of the uh, people who have committed crimes, yeah, you're not any better than any other criminal. And that's just my, that's my thinking on it. And finally, my last one is a crazy story. So, Carrie McCandless, and I hope I said that last name right. Carrie McCandless was a 29-year-old and her victim was 17 years old. And it was in Fort Carl, Fort Fort Collins, and I think that's in Colorado. I really don't know. I probably should look that up. Momento, poor favor. 
I have just confirmed with my sources that yes indeed Fort Collins is in Colorado. That being said, she was a teacher at Brighton High School and she was charged with, I just want to read the story because it's crazy. So I'm going to read it verbatim. So this is a quote. Um, Carrie McCandless was a 29 year old teacher employed at Brighton Charter High School in Brighton, Colorado, when she was charged in relation to alleged sexual encounters with a 17 year old male student during an overnight school camping trip in October 2006. Investigators stated McCandless plied the young man with alcohol and engaged in sexual activity with the boy mere feet away from other students. Get ready, y'all, because here's the kicker. She's mere feet away from other students, but the principal of the school, Chris McCandless, recognize the last name? Anyone? Anyway, happens to be Carrie's husband immediately fired the woman, according to this. In the summer of 2007, McCandless pled guilty and was sentenced to 45 days in jail. Say what? 45 days in jail? <laughs> Interesting. And in March 2009, McCandless was jailed again under charges of violation of probation after she had consumed alcohol and was found in the bed of another parolee. And I don't think if you're on probation and stuff, you can hang out with other people that are on probation or parole or whatever. Anyway, more interesting than the fact that her husband was the principal is the fact that they continue to stay married. What did she end up pleading guilty to? Let me tell you. She pleaded guilty to sexual assault on a child by one in a position of trust and contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Wow. My, 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 what charges? Her victim, his name was Tommy, he actually ended up coming forward and doing a segment on the Today, uh, yeah, on the Today Show. And in this, Tommy's parents, Mark and Cherie Clay, also appeared on the show. And this is what they had to say about the way that the school handled it. And the teacher had drank alcohol, kissed, and kind of fondled each other during the trip. Um, and he also, in, in, in the affidavit, admitted that it wasn't the first time that they had made out. However, in October, school administrators were reportedly made aware of concerns that the teacher was having an appropriate relationship uh, with one of her students, uh, but neither the principal of the school nor the school board president notified authorities. Instead, they called the victim to the office. Now, back it up. Who's the principal? That's Carrie's husband. Who's the school board uh, president? David Monday. What's important about this? David Monday, or Mundy, Mundy, uh, is their friend. He is this couple's friend, so yay. So, fast forward. Uh, Tommy's like, you know, he didn't want his teacher to take fault, and he didn't really feel like he had anything to lose versus her. Back to Mark and Cherie being on the show. They said, they claimed that they had a meeting with Mr. Mundy and he basically told them, you know, that they needed to take Tommy out of school and that he needed to protect his friendship, you know, the friendship between Carrie and her husband, Chris, AKA the principal, and that he needed to save their marriage. Uh, yeah, but who gives a crap about their marriage? Uh, it's clearly riddled with problems, right? So in November, she ends up getting fired from her job. Um, and that was because, you know, a local news reporter decided they were going to point it out to the world, if you will. So she was offered, of course, a plea deal by prosecutors and um, obviously got nothing. Because again, she got uh, like, what was it, 45 days in prison. She was sentenced to five years intensive supervised probation and 45 days in jail. Yeah. So again, let's go back. 29 years old, 17 year old victim. Alcohol was involved. She ends up getting a slap on. 
So, in summary, Miss Carey is only sentenced to 45 days in jail. She's registered as a sex offender. She pleaded guilty to um, sexual assault on a child by uh, one in a position of trust and contributing to the delinquency of a minor. That's it, and that's all. Wow, what a what a uh, slap in the face to everybody else. Because again, if this was a man, we would be like, die, feed him to the wolves, care kind of thing. It just blows my mind. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really know what else to say about that. But here's the thing. Um, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Am I right? I don't think that based on your looks, based on your uh, gender, or um, affluency, that you should be given any less of a sentence than anybody else, any person of the opposite sex would receive. Personally, um, I don't think that any person should receive a lighter sentence, a reduced sentence, um, based on affluency, based on your looks, based on, um, I don't even know, just whatever a person of the opposite sex would be charged with in that situation, I think that that's what uh, everybody should be charged with. It should be across the table because let me tell you, I don't care if uh, a child of mine is um, sexually assaulted by a man or a woman, I'm going to be equally upset and I'm going to come after you equally hard. And that's just the facts, period, facts. Um, but let me know what you guys think. I mean, do you think that women, you know, like maybe because of their, most women do have more of a nurturing and caring nature about them. Do you think because of this that maybe, you know, for some reason they should be given lighter sentences than males? Or do you feel like it's an absolute injustice that these women, uh, or most women, get off so lightly? I personally don't agree with it at all. And I think that um, we're not doing... Uh, ourselves any favors, we're not doing these teachers any favors, we're not doing uh, female sex offenders any favors, um, and potential future victims any favors by letting them off so easily. That's my, that's my opinion. But let me know what you think down below, um, and if you have any stories that you know of, of uh, teachers that were, you know, treated so um, special, if you will. I want to know what you think. I still just can't believe it. I can't believe that Carrie's freaking husband was the dang principal. And, uh, obviously, seems like he tried to cover it up. Him and the, uh, board president or whatever. That's just ludicrous. It makes it ten times worse that these people basically tried to cover it up or shoo it under the rug and had the audacity to suggests that the victim leave the school. No, no, no. Y you and your wife need to leave the school. Seriously. And you know what? Take the board member, president, whatever with you too, because he's garbage as well. That's just my opinion though. Okay. Anyway, again, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this little segment. And if you have any ideas of shows you would like me to uh, or topics you would like me to talk about, let me know down below because I will actually read them, respond to them, and make the show. Okay? Thanks, guys. I hope you have a great day and the rest of your week is amazing.